traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sabretooth nations. And secondly, to invite, to welcome you uh, to the Vancouver Aquarium today. Uh, our mission here at OceanWise is to inspire both local and global communities to become OceanWise. So thank you very much for coming, and I'm going to play a short video that will give you a little bit of information about what we do and the things that can be found on our awesome website. check it out and another amazing thing on the website is all the information about these uh, community education events such as the one you're attending so if you want to see upcoming events and what's going on you can go up here click on our work and then community education and there you can access all upcoming events as well as subscribe to um, to hear about to get emails to hear about new events that have been uh, posted uh, so here are some events that are coming up that you might be interested in. Uh, on Tuesday, the 26th of June, uh, we have our June Ocean Matters Lecture entitled The Truth About Everyday Plastics. Um, so Stephen Chastin is an ocean-wise scientist, and he will be looking at four everyday household items. He will examine how and why our use and disposal of these items is damaging the environment and how this um, influences and is influenced by large-scale global issues. In addition, um, he will show us how he explores the world of microplastics under the microscope, which is his everyday job. And we'll talk about some of the research that we are doing here at Ocean Waste to learn about some of these processes um, as well that are causing the problems, as well as how this research can help us all to make uh, better choices about our everyday items, as well as potential ways in which we could suggest, I suppose, to, that our, we could redesign our approach to plastics as a society. So it looks to be a very interesting talk. And second of all, this is a little bit in the future, but if any of you are teachers or no teachers or are educators of any kind, we are having a Teachers Appreciation Night on the 30th of August. So this event is free for all educators, principals, teacher candidates and non-formal educators, which includes any of you um, Vancouver Aquarium volunteers, for example. Um, and we're doing this because OceanWise appreciates everything teachers and educators in our region do to inspire the next generation of students. So come along, there'll be a cash bar, giveaways, as well as, as discounts for field trips. And last, um, the Vancouver Aquarium OceanWise is a self-supporting non-profit organization. And as you know, uh, this event is um, free for everybody who attends because 
we think it's very important to make events such as these as accessible to as many people as possible. However, they're not free to put on. So if you have a, um, a loony or so in your pocket as you leave, it, we would be absolutely, um, we'd be really grateful if you could donate the donation box that I'll leave just by the door over there. And that's enough of me. I will now introduce our guest for the evening, which is Todd McClish. He is a Rhode Island-based writer and has been writing about wildlife for over 20 years. His fourth book, he is here to talk about, The Return of the Sea Otter, which you may have seen outside, which looks to be a really nice book. Um, especially the photos inside I thought were fantastic. Um, so in this book, Todd journeys along the Pacific coast from California to Alaska to track the status, health, habits and viability of the sea otters. And with that, he'll tell you all about his adventures. Uh, thanks, Todd. Hi. How's everybody doing out there? Excellent. Me too. Uh, great to be here. The last time I stood before this podium was four years ago when I came here to give a talk about narwhals, which is a subject of my previous book. And the day after I gave that presentation, I um, went and met some of the otters here. And that was essentially my first day conducting research for my next book, which is, is this one about sea otters. So, so the aquarium here clearly plays a role in, in uh, frankly, in both of those books. Uh, I got a chance to meet uh, uh, Walter, one of the otters that had been uh, rescued here, uh, and some of the other otters on display on, on exhibit. So it was wonderful to be here and, and uh, great to be back again. And as I began to conti and continue to do my research on sea otters, and I told friends and family what I was doing, the first reaction from almost everybody whenever I said sea otter was, ah, oh. <laughs> because of course we all know why. There are these cute and adorable things, uh, and uh, I can't agree uh, anymore, but, um, or any less. But um, uh, there, of course, so much more than that. And so uh, sea otters are, are not only these cute and adorable creatures, they are filled with superlatives. I'm not hearing any ahs and oohs out there, uh, but that's okay. Uh, there, there's so much more than cute and adorable creatures. Sea otters are filled with superlatives. They are the smallest of all of the marine mammals on Earth, uh, and yet larger than most people imagine. Most people who see a picture of an otter don't realize it may be uh, five feet long or uh, 100 pounds. They're, they're the heaviest members of the weasel family. Again, 100 pounds or so, uh, bigger, bigger than any of the other weasel family members. Sea otters are the animal with the densest fur of any creature on Earth, uh, 100, no, a million hairs per square inch. Uh, that's a lot. We'll talk more about that as we go along. They're the only marine mammal that has no blubber, um, but because, of course, they have this wonderful coat. So lots of interesting storylines to tell about the, sea, uh, about the sea otter and all its interesting physiological adaptations and so on. But, um, but perhaps the most important thing to start with is the fact that sea otters are what biologists refer to as keystone species. They are extremely or unusually influential in the marine environment where they live. They live in this kelp forest. And as you can see in the picture here on the left, this is a healthy kelp forest with, with this wonderful kelp growing from the seafloor, perhaps as, as high as 100 feet to the surface of the water. It's filled with sea urchins and sea cucumbers and all sorts of other wonderful uh, marine invertebrates on the seafloor. It's got sea otters and seals and all sorts of fish swimming through the middle of the water column. So a wonderful, healthy environment that in incorporates lots and lots of different species. But if you remove the sea otter from that environment, which, which we did, and we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, things change dramatically because the sea otter's favorite food is the sea urchin. If you remove the otter, the urchin population skyrockets. And the urchin's favorite food is kelp. They eat all the kelp. And following that, all the rest of the species that live in that kelp forest disappear. And you end up with the picture on the right side here of what we refer to as an urchin barren. Nothing there but a bunch of unhealthy sea urchins. Uh, 
You bring the sea, the sea otter back into that environment, which we have done, and the otters start eating the urchins, the kelp starts to grow again, and all the rest of the species return. Very unusual that one species could have such an influential role in its environment. If you think about most of the other ecosystems you're familiar with, you remove one species and the ecosystem generally survives and, and maintains itself and continues as it ordinarily would until you remove a bunch more. But, but in this case, it's remove this one species, this influential sea otter, and it, that, that habitat changes dramatically. So of course, I decided I needed to go and explore that habitat, and I went on my very first scuba diving adventure. That's me on the right. Uh, and um, yes, if, if this was a video, you'd see me shaking because I was quite concerned. My, my first dive wasn't entirely confident I knew what I was doing. And um, we sunk below the water, and we were in about 40 feet of water. This was in Monterey, California. Got to the bottom, it was spectacular. We had uh, uh, starfish the size of pizza boxes. We had um, all sorts of uh, sand dollars standing up on a line, uh, sort of like lines of soldiers. We, it had neuter branches, these wonderful sea slugs and, and bright, bright colors of greens and purples and oranges, uh, wonderful fish of all sorts, and, and this kelp, which really was exciting to swim around. And it was my first scuba dive, and I was not confident in what I was doing. And I felt a little uncertain, and so I signaled to the guys I was with that we needed to go to the surface, I needed to fix some gear. And we slowly get up there, and I fix my gear, and everything was fine, I'm feeling better. And before we sunk down below the water again, we took a look to the left. And when we did so, we saw this guy. And this was a, an otter that was literally just sitting at the surface of the water, grooming for a little while, uh, eating some wonderful shellfish for a little while. We were quite close. It didn't seem to be bothered by us. Um, but it certainly helped to exhibit all of the uh, exhibit to me all of the wonderful uh, behaviors that these animals showcase. So sea otters can dive for, well, five or six minutes is probably as long as they go. Uh, they can dive as deep perhaps as, as 300 feet, but more likely they're, they're usually in shallower water than that. A, a typical dive probably lasts for a minute or so down to 100 feet. Uh, they eat a lot. Uh, and if you've seen the, the otters here on exhibit and at feeding time, you can see that they eat a lot. 30% of their weight they need to eat every single day to maintain their health, to maintain their metabolism, to maintain, um, to, to keep themselves warm. So 30% of a 100 pound animal, that's 30 pounds of food every day. Um, that means I'm eating, I won't tell you how much, but, but a lot more than that. So, uh, so clearly that, that's one clear impact that they have, and that's how they keep those sea urchins in check from taking over the kelp forest environment. Um, sea urchins, of course, are one of the only tool users out there in the animal world, and uh, I'm sure you've seen those pictures as well. The otter that's lying on its back at the surface with a rock cracking open a, a shellfish of some sort, a clam or a crab or an urchin. Uh, and of course, they even have a favorite tool so sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll have a tool that they want to keep using for all of their meals. They dive down to the bottom, they bring up a crab, they crack it open with a, a tool, a little rock of some sort. But they want to save that rock, so they have a little pouch of, in their armpit. Actually, it's really just an extra flap of skin, but it's a great place to store your favorite tool, so when you want to dive down to the seafloor and find some more food and come back to the surface, you can retrieve that favorite tool and crack open your next bit of food. So, uh, so wonderful, wonderful um, behaviors they exhibit. Some even specialize in the food that they, uh, per that they eat, and they even specialize and have a particular tool for each particular kind of food. You might have one tool to open up snails, and another tool to open up crabs, and another tool to open up um, uh, clams. Uh, and so they have those available to themselves uh, occasionally. And well, if one of those tools is, isn't available, a, a, boat hull, a boat hull will do. So, so, so fun behaviors and, and exciting things to, uh, to enjoy as we're, as we're watching sea otters in the wild and, and here in the aquarium. <clears throat> now. Um, uh, I got to learn a lot about sea otter reproduction, and I have to tell you that um, uh, it isn't a romantic experience for the otters. Uh, we, we have here a kind of a, a unique pho photograph. This is a, a sea otter with twins. Kind of hard to even realize that there are two baby otters there on that 
on that mother's belly. So they typically give birth to just one pup at a time, but in this case, it's two. Uh, so as I said, a not, not a very romantic experience. The, the male typically bites down on the female's nose to hold her down during the mating process. And sometimes she rips, the, the male will rip her nose right off, uh, causing um, uh, serious injury and even death on occasion. Um, you can often tell the difference between a wild male otter and a female otter because the female is the one with scars on her nose. It's also an exhausting experience to be a female sea otter. Uh, she is always either pregnant or, uh, or raising a pup. It's essentially a six-month gestation period that she's pregnant and six months until she is uh, weaned the little one off to go on its own, and by that time she's pregnant again. Uh, and of course, very exhausting if she has to provide 30 pounds of food for herself every day, plus additional food for the young one. Uh, that's, that's an awful lot of work. She doesn't get very much, much time to rest. Um, but nonetheless, um, they go off and perhaps they live for 10 or 12 years. That's typical in the wild, maybe 15 uh, here in captivity, uh, but they, they do have a pretty decent long life for, uh, for these guys. Now, uh, as, we, as I sort of said at the beginning, their fur is perhaps one of the things that they're most famous for. Again, a million hairs per square inch. That's a lot of hair. I mean, a human is supposed to have 100,000 hairs on their entire head, and I have a lot fewer than that. But, um, but, but yes, this very dense fur coat, <laughs> this very dense fur coat is also pretty heavy. It might represent 30% of their weight. So the, their fur coat itself is 30 pounds or so for an adult sea otter. Uh, and it's a coat they can't take off. They need that fur coat to stay warm. It has the insulating capacity of about six inches of blubber. But it also means they really can't get out of the water and spend very much time out of the water because they will overheat very quickly. So the, of course, they can't take off that, that wonderful fur coat. <clears throat> now, the fur coat is also, it also requires a huge amount of, of, um, of grooming. If you're seeing a sea otter and it's not feeding and it's not um, diving for food and it's not um, um, just sleeping, it is probably uh, grooming. And they really need to groom that fur coat to maintain uh, its function. Uh, you know, this, it has um, little kind of hooks on the fur that mat it together and, and contain it in such a way that it's so waterproof that even though these animals live in the marine environment for almost 100% of your, their life, uh, water never touches their skin. Uh, and so that's how they're, that they keep that cold water away from their skin and that allows them to uh, be warm just because of the wonderful insulating capacity of the of the fur coat. Now, of course, that fur coat is also pretty buoyant, makes them quite buoyant. In fact, baby sea otters can't dive beneath the surface of the water. Uh, that coat makes them so buoyant, they try to dive beneath the surface and they pop up like a cork. Watch for that. That's quite an entertaining thing to see as well. Unfortunately, that uh, fur coat is also, well, it's also their greatest vulnerability because of the, the demand historically for fur coats, for, for furs of one sort or another. So the, the, the historic story is that sea otters were hunted to near extinction during the late 1700s into the, or into the middle of the 1800s for their furs. There was a great demand in China for furs. And for most of that time, the demand was met by Russian um, trappers trapping foxes and rabbits and other things. And then they discovered sea otters on the coast of uh, Russia. And they realized how much money they could get for those furs. And so they followed the, uh, the Aleutian Islands across Alaska to um, capture, kill sea otters for their fur. At the same time, Captain Cook, you heard about him, he was exploring the North Pacific and ended up on the coast of, of uh, Vancouver Island in the 1780s. And he met with some natives who he traded for some sea otter furs. When he got back to China and realized how much he could get for those furs, that launched a very lucrative, very intense ship-based um, trade for sea otters. 
So this fir tree lasted for 60 or 70 years, and it was mostly either the Russian trappers coming across the Aleutians, or the ships from England and uh, North Northeast US going around uh, South America, up the coast, and trading with the natives along the Pacific coast here. Uh, over the course of about 60 or 70 years, sea otter numbers dropped from a total of about 250,000 down to 1,000. Uh, and that basically ended the fur trade because you couldn't find them anymore. And it almost ended the sea otters because they couldn't find each other anymore to, to breed with. So that was quite a concern. And, and clearly, uh, after the fur trade ended, uh, the otters finally got a chance to rebuild their populations. So, so if you see here, this gives us a sense of the, the range of the sea otter. And the original range, the historic range, went all the way down to, to Mexico, down here on the right, extended all the way up the Pacific coast to Alaska, out the Aleutian Islands, down to that Kamchatka Peninsula of Russia, and down to the northern part of Japan. Uh, after the fur trade, this map really looked like a couple of dots along the, the, uh, the Aleutians because there were basically no more left in most places. A couple others in, in South Central Alaska, but mostly otters were gone. And in the 100 years since then, you can see the cross hatching on the map, the otters have really recolonized most of that range. They're still not in Mexico, they're still not in Oregon, uh, but they're um, all the way up to, uh, from uh, Washington through British Columbia to Alaska out to the, to the uh, Aleutians, and not quite yet down to Japan yet. But they certainly are recolonizing and do a good, doing a good job of that. But what was particularly interesting to me as I was doing this, this study was that in each different part of their range, there seemed to be a different story of how they are recovering and how they're doing now. So here in California, you can see that the, that the otters are confined to a relatively short area of the coastline south of San Francisco, north of Los Angeles. They're basically nowhere else in the California coastline. Uh, and, and in fact, it was originally believed that the California population was totally wiped out during the fur trade. But in uh, the 1930s, there was a couple that bought a new telescope. And they were testing out their telescope along the coast. And they observed uh, a couple of dozen sea otters. And they were immediately protected by the state of California. And those 20 or 30 sea otters have grown in numbers in the last 80 years to a point where now there are about 3,000 sea otters in that short central California coastline. So the otters are really doing well there. In fact, so well, in the middle of that coastal uh, range, there are uh, the, the population is so dense that there, that there isn't enough food available for the numbers to, to grow even more. And so they're trying to expand their range northward and southward along the California coast. The problem, unfortunately, is that at the northern end of the, of the current range and at the southern end of the current range are a bunch of great white sharks. Uh, essentially, at those two locations, there are seal rookeries and sharks are drawn there to feed on the young seals. And because the otters are, are trying to expand their range in that same area, the sharks are eating many of the, uh, of the sea otters. In fact, they're not even eating them. They're biting them. They take one big bite. They realize, oh, this is a big fur ball. I, I don't want to eat a big fur ball. They spit it out. And uh, the otter dies, but the shark doesn't even benefit by getting the nutrition from the animal. So uh, for the most part, we have a bunch of otters with one big bite taken out of them uh, that die, wash up on shore. That seems to be the leading cause of death for uh, sea otters in California. Uh, the good news, though, is that there are still so many in that central part of the range that that's where most of the research is happening. And so I got to spend some time with some researchers actually trapping otters along the California coastline. And that, for me, was quite an amazing adventure. We essentially had a couple of divers, no, not me, uh, a couple of divers go under the water um, with these wonderful little devices that pulled them quickly through the water. And underneath the otters that were resting at the surface, and as they approached from beneath, there was a trap on the top of that little scooter device that pulled them through the water. They got the otters at the surface and trapped them and brought them to shore. Amazing 
to see how that whole process worked. But we would have brought those otters to shore to the aquarium. This is Monterey Bay Aquarium, where they were immediately implanted with a little tracking device so that the otters could be monitored for years to come. And the otter, within an hour after it had been trapped, was released back into the wild exactly where it was captured. For every single day, for the next several years, those otters were relocated by a team of volunteers and biologists and monitored for hours at a time every single day, every day around the clock, uh, around the calendar. And they were observed to see what they were eating and how often they were diving and who they were interacting with and uh, what habitat they were in. And so based on this kind of research, we know so much more about sea otters than almost any other marine creature. Um, they, these creatures, that, these animals, they bring their food up to the surface so we can see exactly what they're eating uh, from, from moment to moment. Uh, and, and we're learning a lot from, from some, captured, ca some captive otters as well. This is Selka, and Selka is uh, an otter that was uh, washed up on the shore in California when it was three or four days old, somehow separated from her mother, and uh, was brought into the aquarium, raised in captivity. They tried to release her back into the wild, but she didn't take, and so they brought her back in again. And now she has become sort of a research animal. She's become part of a research study on the sensory systems of uh, marine mammals like like sea otters. And so we know, for instance, that b because of studies using selca, we know that sea otters have a really unique uh, eyesight, for instance. They don't have a better eyesight than most other animals, although better than us. But they have a unique ability to see equally well under the water as they can above the water. You know, you and I, we see great in the air, but not so good underwater when we have to open our eyes. But, and it has to do with the curvature of their eye lens. Uh, so they can, uh, they have muscles around their eye that, that enables them to change the curvature of their eye lens so that it can be one curve for underwater, and they change it a little bit to be able to see um, with a different curvature above the water, allowing to them to see equally well above and below the water. So that's kind of cool and very unique in the mammalian world. I'm not sure of any other animal that has that ability, although I suspect not many have been tested in that capacity. Um, sea otters also uh, have, well, not much um, for hearing. You know, they don't have a great a hearing system, although, uh, again, still better than humans, but uh, compared to other marine, marine animals, they, they don't have much for hearing, but um, they don't really need a great hearing because, you know, crabs and clams and the other things they eat, they don't speak very much. So, so hearing isn't particularly important. They can, however, uh, taste toxins in their food, and they know to spit it out. So if they're eating shellfish and it might have been poisoned by some red tide or some other, or other toxin or pollutant, they can actually taste that and spit it out, and, um, and something that we haven't learned to do. Uh, so, so that's another one of those unique skills that these guys seem to have. And again, we're learning about some of that with Selka and a few other captive sea otters. Actually, Selka is now a... Um, uh, uh, sort of a, a mother that's helping to raise otters back at the, uh, raise uh, abandoned otters back at the aquarium now that she's done her job uh, learning, teaching us a bit about their sensory systems. So if we go northward now and we get to the coast of Oregon and Washington, a totally different story there. Sea otters were wiped out of the Oregon and Washington coastline during the fur trade. None were left whatsoever. Uh, by the 1960s, there were efforts to take some otters from the Aleutian Islands, which had recovered quite well, and reintroduce them elsewhere. So late 60s, early 70s, um, over the course of three years, there were otters that were brought to Oregon from Alaska, reintroduced on the Oregon coast. None of them survived. Actually, a couple of them survived for a few years, but three years later, and there were no or, or, uh, otters on the Oregon coast. And still today, there are no otters on the Oregon coast. Uh, go northward to Washington, similar story. All the otters were wiped out during the fur trade. They were reintroduced to over three years in the late 60s, early 70s. A few of them, maybe 12 of them, survived. 
And over the 50 years since then, those 12 have now expanded to about 14 or 1,500 otters on the Washington coastline. So they're, they're doing well, growing in numbers at a pretty healthy rate. So they seem to be doing well. Again, it's just the northern Washington outer coastline where the otters are found. Um, again, then we, oh, oh, the woman here on the right with the eye patch, that's, um, that's a, a graduate student at the University of Washington. I spent some time with her, uh, helping her with her research on the food and the prey that these otters are eating at the Washington coastline because uh, there were studies of what the otters ate during the first decade or so after they had been released into the area. And, uh, and after lots of, of um, growing populations of cram uh, clams, and clams and crabs and urchins were in that area when the otters were gone. But you know, 30 years later, now they're eating slightly different food because all the, their favorite foods have been depleted for the most part. Uh, anyway, great to spend some time in the field with these biologists and learn as much as I can. And, uh, and that was one of the fun, the fun adventures I got uh, there. If we come further north from Washington, we're of course right here in, in British Columbia, and the story is somewhat similar. Uh, all the otters were wiped out from the British Columbia coastline during the fur trade, uh, and there were none left for 100 years. Uh, and in the late 60s, a number of otters were released into uh, one little bay in the northwest coast of Vancouver Island, and in that time, or since that time, the otter population has grown from 30 or 40 uh, in that bay to 6,500 along the British Columbia coastline and expanded uh, northward almost to Alaska by now. So certainly the population here is booming and doing well. They're not quite expanding as quickly to the south towards here in, in Vancouver, but uh, they're likely to get here sometime soon, eventually. The guy on the left side of this picture, his name is Roger Dunlop. He was a, uh, uh, he's a sea otter biologist for some of the uh, First Nations groups here in BC. He invited me on a sailing trip around Nootka Island uh, along the northwest coast of, of Vancouver Island, and um, we were surveying for sea otters. It was quite an amazing experience. Uh, in part because I'm a really bad sailor. I was mostly scared for most of the time. Uh, but we finally got into some quiet coves where we saw hundreds of sea otters and it was quite spectacular. And what Roger was telling me was that he thought that all of the otters we were seeing there were gonna be mother and pup pairs. But it didn't look that way because they were all the same size. Until we got closer and closer and all the little babies that were actually adult sized by then, jumped back on mama's belly, <laughs> realized that they were kind of scaredy cats. Um, but clearly that gave us an indication that yes, indeed, these are uh, uh, mother and pup pairs, not just all adults, although those uh, babies were certainly on their way, heading out, the heading out the door and going on their own very soon. If we go north even further to Southeast Alaska, we get to, well, that's where the story is somewhat similar, again, but the numbers are even higher. Again, all the otters were wiped out of the southeast Alaska during the fur trade, uh, and they were reintroduced at six different locations in southeast Alaska in the late 60s. And that six different locations seemed to help because they expanded in all directions from those six locations. And the hundred or so otters that survived the release uh, are now 25,000 sea otters along the southeast Alaska coast. And I show you this picture here because these guys aren't too happy about it. So the dive fisheries, those folks who are diving in for, for sea urchins and for sea cucumbers and for some of the other uh, shelled creatures, uh, aren't happy that the sea otters have returned. Because of course, um, what happened was that sea otters were gone for 100 years. And so urchin numbers skyrocketed and sea cucumber numbers not skyrocketed and clam numbers and crab numbers. And of course that means that then people created commercial fisheries for those species. And as a result, uh, they were keeping those, those species numbers low or, or in check. And now we have sea otters that have returned and the sea otters are better fishermen than the fishermen, than the fishermen are. So now there's this, this, quite, this, this quite direct conflict and um, the fishermen are losing their catch. They're, they're under the water right next to sea otters that are able to find and eat these species faster than the fishermen are. 
Uh, the state of Alaska has, has proposed to implement uh, bounties on sea otters to get rid of some of them so that uh, the fishermen can continue their practice. So it's, it's a, a bit of a controversy and continues to be one, uh, even though uh, the popularity of the sea otters themselves is certainly sort of overcoming the uh, economic loss that might be happening as a result of the, the fishery. Now the other storyline in Southeast Alaska is that native Alaskans that live on the coast are still allowed to hunt sea otters. Uh, and so uh, essentially what's, what's happening there, they had traditionally been hunting sea otters and, and making handicrafts for their, for their tribes. And um, they are now, even though it's prohibited that they be hunted uh, by others, they're still allowed to do so. However, they went for 100 years without any sea otters in the area. They went for generations that having lost those traditions for the most part. And so there are very few sea otter hunters out there. They, they haven't learned, relearned the skill for the most part. A few of them have. This gentleman on the right side of the picture, his name is Peter Williamson. And not only has he become one of the best known sea otter hunters in Southeast Alaska, but he's become a sea otter fashion designer. And he has fashion shows in New York City and, and Los Angeles and elsewhere showing off the dresses and the other garments that he's making out of sea otter fur. Quite spectacular. Uh, I just traveled down to south, Southeast Alaska and visited some of the shops there and, and his, um, his garments and other things were for, for sale there. So uh, qu quite, quite again, another different kind of story happening there in Southeast Alaska. And then the story is totally different if we go west to the Aleutian Islands. That's where the otter numbers originally were largest. That's where they were hunted to near extinction first. And because there were a few still there after the fur trade was over, that's where they rebounded fastest. By the 1960s, there were perhaps 100,000 sea otters along the, co along the Aleutian Islands. But by 1980, those numbers started to decline and nobody really knew why, and they continued to decline. And over the course of 20 years, the sea otter population in the Aleutian Islands went from 100,000 down to about 6,000. And that's where they still remain today, quite low, uh, and nobody really knew what was going on. The marine environment seemed healthy. Uh, all the other animals that were supposed to be around were still around and, and doing what they were supposed to do, uh, until a few researchers uh, spent some years studying different populations of otters in different islands along the Aleutians and realized that it was killer whales that seemed to be the cause of this big decline in sea otter numbers. Now, sea, the, the sea otters, excuse me, the killer whales along that, uh, that region, uh, for the most part, were eating primarily seals um, and small whales. These are, these are marine mammal eating sea, uh, killer whales. And it was believed that one family unit of killer whales, one group of you know, six or eight or 10 or 12 killer whales, if that one group changed their diet from seals to sea otters, that could be the entire explanation for the decline of 100,000 sea otters down to 6,000 sea otters in 20 years. Uh, and so nobody knows exactly if it was just one family unit or if, if there were others, but certainly that seems to be the explanation. And we're in a, you know, we're in a situation where what do you do? Because both animals are considered endangered, both animals are protected in one way or another, both animals certainly have uh, their fan base, and so if this is a natural process that's been happening, we can't really do anything to, to protect the otters at the expense of the killer whales. And so we have to let nature take its course. And the biologists are hoping that what nature happens is that the otter numbers will get s small enough that those few killer whales that switch their diet to sea otters will have a hard time finding sea otters and they'll switch back again. And hopefully that will enable the otter population to, to rebound again. So um, an interesting story and such a different story between the sharks in California and the killer whales in the Aleutians. But that storyline even continues even, even in a more bizarre way. I should point out a couple things about, a couple things about these pictures. The, the sea otter on the right, I love the fact that he has his hands out of the, or his paws out of the water. And the biologists call this behavior touchdown hands. <laughs> a, a sea otter signaling a touchdown. Anyway, I thought that was cute. Maybe you don't. 
picture on the right shows a, a, a sea otter autopsy. I, w I went to learn about um, the health of sea otters and from some scientists and got to observe a sea otter autopsy. And uh, the blonde woman on the left, that's actually my wife who was uh, recruited to help out in the autopsy process. So she was uh, quite pleased to get, her, get literally get her hands dirty on that project. But nonetheless, the interesting uh, health story related to sea otters is very different from Alaska to, to California also. We have uh, in Alaska, if you're a sea otter and you're not dying from killer whales, then you're probably dying from streptococcus, the strep throat virus that we, that we get. How or why it gets into the marine environment and causes sea otters to die, we don't know, but the, the autopsy that you see the picture of, um, they found this a lesion in their uh, in an otter's aortic valve, which is a, an, uh, a sign of the streptococcus virus causing that death. Uh, so again, in Alaska, we have killer whales and we have streptococcus. If you're an otter in California and you are not dying from a great white shark death uh, bite, you are most likely dying from something called toxoplasmosis, uh, which, believe it or not, comes from kitty poop. So it's a bacterium in the inside of a cat's intestine, which sloughs off when it defecates. That somehow makes it from land into water, into a stream perhaps, finds its way down to a bay, and that's how it finally gets into the marine environment. It's absorbed in the shellfish, and the otter eats the shellfish. That's the leading cause of death of California otters from a white shark fight. So, so a very strange story, uh, and how that whole process works is a little bit uncertain, but it's so serious in California that if you were to go to buy a box of kitty litter for your domestic cat, it has a special label on it that says how you're supposed to properly dispose of it in order to protect the Seattle population. Again, strange storyline we have here of these otters in California that are affected by one thing and otters in Alaska affected by something entirely different. And those here along the BC coast and in Washington are basically not dealing with either of those issues. Neither of those predators, neither of those diseases are significant causes of death for, for the otters here in BC. So, interesting story and one of the things that got me uh, curious about these animals because it's so different from place to place along there, the coastline. What's not different is that the biggest threat that these animals face going forward really has entirely to do with oil spills, with the fact that this fur coat is so important to them, uh, to keep them warm, to keep them healthy, uh, and oil will do a job on that. Uh, the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska in 1989 killed 4,000 sea otters. And it took them 25 years to recover their population back to the numbers that they had before the oil spill. And essentially what happens, you get a little dime-sized uh, uh, spot of oil on a sea otter fur, and that sort of acts as if it's um, a hole in your wetsuit. And it allows the, uh, the water, the cold water of the Pacific, to get to that skin and get them cold and they die from hypothermia. Or they groom their fur and they ingest that oil and they die from that. So oil really is the biggest threat that these guys are facing. And you know, one oil spill on the Washington coast would easily wipe out the 1,400 otters that live there. It would take a really big oil spill in California to kill all those otters, but certainly the population would be decimated qu quite significantly, and the same is true almost everywhere that, that otters are found. So, so clearly, that's the biggest threat that these guys really are facing. There's the awe that I was waiting for today. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Uh, so, so this is a photo that, that I took at, uh, at Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, and of course, this is indeed a little baby sea otter, one that had been uh, rescued from the shore, was being brought in for, into captivity to be raised and, um, uh, and to be released later. But I took this picture in part because I like the outfit the guy's wearing. Uh, they call this the Darth Vader outfit because, of course, they're trying to raise the otter uh, without uh, it getting sort of attached to humans because when you try to release an otter back into the wild and it realizes its only food comes from people, they're gonna go to every swimmer and, and uh, a surfboarder and whoever to try to find food, so that's not a good thing. But the other reason I show you this picture um, is 
is because, well, these guys are adorable, as we know, but if you have children or grandchildren, or it's you yourself that wants to be a marine biologist, oh, the best job in the world is the ones who have to go and spend their days grooming baby sea otters. They got to teach these little guys how to groom themselves. And I sat there um, for 20 minutes next to this guy grooming this lady, this little baby sea otter, and it was the most adorable moment of my life. The little, the little massaging its feet and giving it a little rub down and. I got to tell you, you know, I tried to be to be uh, sort of balanced about this experience as I'm doing my Seattle research, and you know, I lost it right there. <laughs> and you will too. So, so if you want a great volunteer job, find an uh, an aquarium that's raising baby sea otters and um, go be the baby sea otter uh, groomer. Can't get any better than that. I, I want to um, well, I want to wrap up in just a moment, but I want to point out that. Um, this is not a sea otter, but this is the closest relative to the sea otters we have here in North America. Uh, this is the other otter in North America. This is indeed a river otter, and sometimes people get confused between the two of them. Uh, but they, they are indeed obviously related, but they have some significant differences. For instance, sea otters always swim on their back. River otters always swim on their belly. If you see an otter that's swimming, you can tell which one it is simply by that. If you um, uh, sea otters uh, spend all of their life in the ocean, in the water, uh, in salt water. Uh, river otters spend half their life on land and half their life on, in fresh water. Again, so if you see an otter in fresh water, it's gonna be a river otter. Occasionally, river otters that live near the coastal zone might uh, wander a little bit into the ocean, but they won't go far and they won't stay long. Uh, river otters are maybe two-thirds the size of a sea otter, so that's one of those other differences. And for me, when you look at these guys, there's clearly a difference that you can identify. This river otter looks like he is well-groomed and sleek and ready to go out and party. He is just smooth looking and, and just, you know, he, he knows what's going on. He, he's ready to party. And then you have these guys. Shaggy looking, you know, not particularly well groomed from the from the river otter's perspective. Now here we go, river otter, sea otter, definitely a different look. So um, once you see a few of both of these species, then you get a good sense of which which is one, which is the other. But clearly, clearly a big difference just in their shaggy appearance of these adorable little guys. And of course, despite the sleek, wonderful appearance of the river otters, the sea otters win hands down with the cuteness factor. I just want to wrap up and leave you with this picture here because um, uh, you know sea otters have, have gone through an awful lot. And one of the things I wanted to ask all the biologists that I, that I interviewed for this book was, you know, what's the future hold? What, what's the outlook for these guys? Uh, and, and all the biologists basically said the same thing. They said, sea otters, well, we're worried because they live in a very close uh, coastal zone to us, and we're their chief threat. You know, they live within a half a mile or a mile of the shoreline. That's where we are. That's where the abundance of, hu of humans uh, are residing. That's where we have the greatest impact. We have fishing impacts. We have recreational impacts. We have runoff from the land impacts. We have potential oil spill impacts. All those kind of things are, are greatly concerning to those of us who love and are studying sea otters. And then, the biologists say, but. They say, but. Look at what we've done to them already. We hunted them to near extinction. There were a thousand of them left after we started with 250,000 or so. They seem to be extremely resilient. And yes, they're facing ki killer whales in, in Alaska and great white sharks in California and various diseases and all sorts of other things. Who knows what climate change might be bringing uh, going forward. Um, but they seem to be very resilient. And, um, and so despite those coastal concerns, uh, they are, the biologists seem to be optimistic that uh, they can overcome whatever we can throw at them, uh, at least for a while. And, uh, and of course, they have a huge popular following uh, exhibited by this room here today. Uh, lots of folks are loving sea otters, and that will hopefully ensure that they will continue to be protected and, and looked upon favorably. I mean, even though, even the fishermen who are being outcompeted for their catch by the sea otters can't deny the, uh, the cuteness factor of sea otters and how popular they are. Uh, they have a wonderful following. Even their enemies seem to love them as well, uh, and why not? 
they're the cutest animals on earth. Thank you very much for having me here today, everybody, and thanks for coming. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions you might have, you want to throw my way at me. More than happy to answer. Yeah, can I go? Oh, thanks. Perfect. So in terms of the sea otters, you were just uh, saying that, so is their main source of food the sea urchins? The sea urchin is clearly their, the sea urchin is clearly their favorite food. And so if there are urchins available, that's what they'll start with. But there are plenty of other shelled creatures that they will feed on as well. Crabs, clams, gooey ducks, uh, sea cucumbers, uh, and, and snails, other kinds of things. But if they had a choice, Sea urchins are the first and preferred food. Other questions? Sir? Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, the sea otters that were introduced to Washington, and that was between 68 and 72, I think, and it was actually 65, right? yeah. and they did take, they, they said that of the numbers, um, about only 12 probably reproduce, and now we have like 1,400. That's, that's my understanding, yes. Why did it not work in Oregon? That's a good question. Nobody seemed to know. Um, when they were released in Oregon, um, and basically it was happening at the same time, they were released as long in the same years as in, as in Washington. Um, so, no, nobody in Oregon was monitoring their, what was happening with them. It took a few years before any of the, the state biologists went out looking for them to see what the status was. My understanding was that there were a few babies born, uh, but after three or four years they were gone. Whether that means that they died, or they headed north, you know, they, they didn't know where they came from and tried to head north and, and maybe they merged with the Washington population. Um, it's, it's really uncertain, but um, for some reason they didn't last in Oregon anyway for, uh, for more than three or four years. Maybe the latitude was too far south? Maybe the ones in California went to better in Oregon? It, it, it's a good question. So certainly there is a California subspecies of sea otter, um, as well as a, a, an Alaska sort of BC subspecies. So maybe, yes, bringing the, the Alaska ones down as far south as Oregon, they didn't adapt well. I'm certain what the real answer is, but we just know that we don't have them. They didn't last, and we don't have any there today. Other questions? I just have a comment on that, and this is just an observation. I'm not a scientist at all. But I am a scuba diver, and I've done about 500 dives off the coast here. And there's great diving on the uh, north end of Vancouver Island, all over BC. There's good diving up in Alaska. There's some good diving. Deep, well, we, th I th we think we have the best. But there is some good diving uh, in northern Washington state. Oregon, I don't know anybody who dives there because it's too rough. They don't have, I wonder if it has to do with the physical, there's no protection. Well, and, and that's a good point. Dense. That, that's a very good point because because I, I, I should have added one extra point and that is that um, so there's a little kelp forest and there's two kinds of kelp. There's, there's um, giant kelp, which is really the, uh, the kelp that the otters prefer, and there's bull kelp. Bull kelp is an annual, so it dies off every year, whereas giant kelp is around year round, it's a perennial. And uh, in the wintertime, uh, otters uh, need, sort of need to hold on to that kelp to keep them in place when we have rough weather. And in Oregon, they have predominantly bull kelp, which is basically broken off and died during the winter months. And so perhaps the fact that Oregon has mostly bull kelp uh, and most of the rest of the regions that have abundant otters seem to have giant kelp, that probably um, plays a role in that, in that absence in Oregon as well. Other questions? Sorry to make you move. Um, I was just wondering if it's known what their natural predators were before humans wiped them out the first time. And if, if, you, if it is known, how can, um, can their natural predators now, like the white sharks and the killer whales, have such an impact on their population decrease? And, and, and that's a good question, another one that we don't really have a great sense of either. Um, why are killer whales in California, in, uh, in the oceans eating otters, but none of the, none of the, the killer whales here in BC are, uh, are doing 
and so you know, lots of uncertainties, and I don't know if anyone really knows what was their chief predator. And for the most part, in this near shore environment, the sea otter was the top predator. Uh, and eating, you know, the, and not eating exciting big mammals, but still certainly the top predator in this near shore environment. Um, and so maybe there wasn't a, a major predator way back when. Um, they were just kept in check by the availability of food. Um, so again, uncertainties in I'm not sure anybody really has an answer either way. Sorry. Uh, in the back, question. Um, so my question is, it sounds like each of the other populations recovered from a pretty small original like, population. So right. is, are there any issues you know of stemming from like, a lack of genetic diversity? Um, and are there any attempts to fix that? that? That's a good question. I've, I've heard that from a number of others who um, are certainly aware that if we have a population down as low as a thousand you know, in their entire range and little tiny, much smaller numbers in, in, in other po pockets, uh, so you know, 30 in California have now blossomed to 3,000. Uh, and so yes, you would imagine that that might be a concern about inbreeding and genetic diversity being a problem. But that doesn't seem to be an issue that has been studied. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any uh, ill effects from inbreeding and genetic diversity. I'm not sure why that would be the case, but um, um, they seem to be doing just fine. P perhaps bringing some of the honors from Alaska down to BC and, and Washington uh, helped to mix it a bit mix things up, up a bit as well, um, but the studies that have done suggest that there isn't any um, genetic issues related to the small numbers that all these otters came from. Uh, any questions? Uh, in which case, if just oh, one more. So, yep. after, oh, okay. I'm just curious, after narwhal and sea otters, what's the next episode? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm still struggling with that at the moment. I finished writing this book a year ago, and now it's finally come out, and, and I'm still debating. You know, I've, I always tell the story that um, I would love to write a book about muskox. I just love muskox. But I think there are only three people who want to read a book about muskox. Uh, it's not a well enough known animal to, to make it a, a lucrative or even a break even situation. So, so, so I'm not entirely certain what the, what the next one is going to be. I'm still looking for that, for that creature that uh, I'd be happy to spend five years of my life studying and writing about, an animal that hasn't been written about too much already, an animal that has a built-in population of, of fans like you all. So uh, if you can come up with something, I'd love to hear. Thank you all very much for having me here, everybody. Have a great evening. So uh, thank you again to Todd. Um, and we're going to be selling some books just outside. If you want to get Todd to sign a book and to buy one, that would be great. And just a reminder, we have a donation box if you have a spare a uh, couple of dollars, that would be fantastic. Otherwise, thank you very much for coming, and hope to see you at another event. Sorry? Can you tell us the price? Uh, the price of the books is 19.95. So, yeah, thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>